and said, anybody know this new superintendent? I got to get, I got to get to him. I got to make sure he knows he need to put us on the agenda and put us first in the room, at least maybe fifth in the room. So I was excited because there was going to be an opportunity for a merging of all sorts throughout the community, but the school and the library, killer. <laughs> and I was so hyped because I reached out to some of my folk and they said, oh yeah, he's a cool guy, you know, give me a call tomorrow and I'll put you in touch with him. I said, okay, it probably was hours later and somebody said, Miss Franken, there's like a really tall guy here to see you. I think he said he's the superintendent. <laughs> I said, what? Just popped in. Those are the ones I like, you know. <laughs> so I go out, we laugh, we talk. No, I go out, I can't find him. And I'm like, where did this guy go? And he is just making his way through our Black Heritage Collection. He is marinating in it. He's coming out and he's throwing out not just titles, but content. And he's having, I was like, oh shoot, he might know, he might be smart. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna go start this conversation with him because I won't know where I'm gonna land. So I just said, no, I'm, I'm glad you came and this is great and it's fun. So you know, we took a tour around the building and that started this amazing experience that we're getting ready to have. Yeah. Yeah, we have a reggae concert. Why are you not talking in your mic? Oh, I'm sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> Actually, uh, we both bossy, right? <laughs> when I first got here, I will tell you something that was told to me by the board is you've got to go out and visit the library. That was the first thing that they told me. They said that it, it is a hub of the community. Um, there's a lot of history in the library. Um, you know, we went to Kenneth Jenkins' collection and everything, and you're the curator of that collection and everything. There was so m a wealth of knowledge of information that was in that collection that I actually was actually reading and picking up some of the books. Now, some of these books are over 400 years old. I don't know if you knew that. And I'm actually touching them. You know, you go to the Smithsonian, they won't even let you go anything or near anything <laughs> like that, right? Because that's, that's considered a historical document. Mm -hmm. But, you know, having said that, you know, when I first got here, I read several books. Sheldon Parrish's book, One Square Mile. You know, being new to a community, you have to know the history, right? Um, there's another book that he wrote um, that I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, I spoke Golden Blue. <laughs> you sent those books because I, I didn't know where they were coming from and everything, but I appreciate you doing that and everything because, it, you know, it, it actually enlightened me. You know, I, I did not know a lot of things about Roosevelt. You know, when you apply for positions, you know, like, for example, I know everybody's probably thinking, you know, this particular slide I'm just going to pull out right here. You know, who is Dr. Wyman and how did he get here? That's, that's probably what you're thinking and everything. But, you know, when you do research, um, because what happens is in individuals in my role or position, they, there's a lot of individuals that recruit you, okay? When you're very, very successful somewhere, uh, whether it's in Michigan, California, New York, it doesn't matter. These individuals that actually look for talent call you up. Okay, you'll be at work and then, you know, your secretary will come to the office and say, you know, we got somebody on the phone here would like to talk to you. He's from California, right? You're like, California, what is that all about? And then you get into a discussion or conversation and they start talking about, well, there was a presentation that you did in Boston, Dr. White, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. And then they talk to you about opportunities, okay? So when the Roosevelt position was opened up, I got a call from several individuals. One of them was actually a family member that lives here in New York. And they told me, you should take a closer look at this district. They would love you. Okay, that, that was basically what was said by the recruiter and the family member that I spoke with. Now the interesting thing about it is when you hear these things and you look, look at, you know, w when you get the calls, you always say, okay, let me look into it, right? So you do your research. And when you do your research, you notice things about a district. Like, for example, one of the things that I noticed that I was very intrigued by was uh, Roosevelt has a strong history, right? It's a very proud community, right? And it's very hardworking, blue collar, which is my background. You may look at me probably think, this guy, there's no way in this world that this guy's uh, come from a poor family uh, and has a blue collar background. Now, both my mom, my mom and my dad were both teachers. That's these individuals right here. Oops, let me back up. Right here. This, my dad was a teacher and a coach. And this was my mom. She was a teacher as well. 
And one of the things that they told me, in, in Michigan, I don't know if you know this, but teachers get paid very, very poorly. I mean, you have a family of six, husband and wife and four children. And yes, um, people were laughing at me. They didn't believe me. But I do have a twin brother that looks just like me. This is me with the funny glasses and everything. This was a joke uh, that my wife put on there when she first got this picture and everything. She said, you're definitely this guy. Um, but this is my twin brother here. And we also played college basketball together, which I'm going to make a connection to with all of you in a moment. But the point that I'm saying is when you get recruited, you do your research and you look into, into the, the district that you're considering on possibly applying for the position. Okay? And that was one of the things that I realized here is that the values in Roosevelt are the same values that I was born and raised in my own hometown, which is a very, very small community. My hometown had only 2,100 people living in it, okay? And it's in the thumb. If you're from Michigan, we always go around the country and we tell you where we're, we're from. They'll say, well, where does it look like when you look at the mitten, right? Right here in the thumb. And we have a saying in the thumb in Michigan, you can't make a fist without a thumb. Right? That's just fact. But the point is, when you do the research and everything, you become intrigued. The district is essentially the same size district that I came from in Michigan. We had a tremendous amount of success in the place that I, I come from. The other part is this. When you apply and you get a phone call, you get your interview. Right? And I could tell you right now that the board and I connected, which is a, an essential component piece. Their vision matched my vision of the work. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a minute. So when you have a connection and a good, a good vision for what it is that you agree and share with uh, one another in the discussions that you have in these interviews, um, things just happen, right? Now, I will tell you, my wife back here, Rakana, she's here tonight. Stand up, hon. She's the better half, as you can tell. Um, all of our kids, we have three, three children. They're all grown, okay? Our oldest, Stacy's 35 now, okay? And they're all grown. Our youngest is going to be 24 this year, okay? Antonio, uh, 31. He wants to be a professional boxer, but we're trying to get him to figure out something else. But anyway, we're, I'm very, very proud of my family and everything, and my wife. And, and, you know, one of the things that we talked about, you know, I've always wanted to come to New York and do some work, um, but didn't have the opportunity, right? Because you don't just apply for jobs, everybody. You, you get recruited to apply for jobs when there's interest. Because when you're, when you're doing a cold application for a job, they don't know you. Right? So, and, and the other part is too, when, when you have people who are recruiting you to, to do the work, you know, the headhunters, in other words, the individuals that do that work, you know, they're looking for talent. They want to have individuals that they bring to the table for the board to consider so that they can have a large group of individuals that are potentially good candidates for the position or job. And then the best rises to the top. Okay? Now, I don't know if I can say that I was the best, but I can tell you this. Um, when I interviewed for the position and the connection that I had made with the board and the shared vision that we had uh, together in those discussions and conversations, I knew that I had a chance. Okay? But here's the thing. When you make decisions, you take a risk, right? The board was willing to take a risk in bringing me here uh, to work for the district. And I took a risk, too, coming here, right? Not knowing a lot of people. But I can tell you this. I've only been on the job for 90 days, okay? Three months. Came here the 1st of July. And I'll tell you what. Roosevelt has been the most welcoming, kindest, and warmest community that anybody knew could come to. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I also want to mention this too, staff, okay? You'll see a shirt behind me that I'm wearing. Last night, we had board appreciation night because the Board of Education does a lot of things and they don't get paid to do that work. And we had all of our buildings represented 
in the room and they presented a lot of nice things to the Board of Education. But one of the things that I decided to do in conjunction with my wife, being from Michigan and the Detroit area, there's a saying that we have, and there's shirts all over, all over the place that you'll see. It says, Detroit versus everybody. Okay? And I'll tell you what. Going back to the blue-collar part of this in Roosevelt, it's been that way here in Roosevelt. And we just had our 60th anniversary here. This district has been in existence for 60 years. And Roosevelt has been taking on everybody. And I'll tell you this, too. We will continue to do that. But the thing I will say is the results are there. I spoke to a, 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 a parent here tonight who has, there's, uh, it's a split family in regards to where the kids are going to school. What, two of them are going to a tr charter and one of the students or, or the kids in the family are going to Roosevelt. Well, I want all of them to go to Roosevelt, okay? And, and the reason why I'm saying that is because of the staff that works in the district have the same work ethic that I have. I go to the games as, as many as I can. And some of, them, some of the kids will even walk up to me in the hallway and say, we didn't see a game, Dr. Whiteman. I said, well, I was probably at another game because there's all these different other athletic programs going on and events and, pro and activities. So I go to all the games. I go to all the events and activities. Um, that's how proud I am of the work that I do. And if I'm there, Staff members, family members, students, they notice that. I mean, for some reason, everybody notices when I'm there. And I'm there because I'm not only there because I'm the superintendent of the district, but I'm there to support the kids, the programs, and our staff. The other thing I'll add to that, and this is the real most important piece of it, is it gets me out of my office, right? And there's my secretary, Diane Battle, over here. It gets me out of my office because day to day it could get crazy. You could get all these emails, phone calls, and people showing up at your door, and the opportunity to go out to kind of decompress, to experience some things that kids love to do. That's the greatest thing as being for, for being my job as superintendent is to get to experience those things where kids are passionate about, you know, soccer. Like, for example, I don't know if you know this. In the first time of the program, our girls' soccer team won the conference. That happened yesterday. <laughs> and it's, it's a proud thing to say that because the, one of the young ladies on the team was being recognized for the, the Rough Rider Spirit Award. So right after the game, she was still in uniform. She came right into the, into the meeting to be recognized. Um, or, and I, what I would like to just say, being recognized for something well-deserving. The academic success and this, the other parts that this particular young lady was doing, such as doing extracurricular activities, because at the end of the day, we're all tired, right? It's those extra things. It's the niche the extra club or the extra team that she was a part of. And she told me that night too with her family that she appreciated being recognized and us taking the time to do that. But that's, that's Roosevelt, right? We take the time to do those small things that later on become a big thing to them in the end. So you can kind of get a good idea of of how it happened, and you're just some of the, the, you see a collage of pictures up here, just to give you a little bit of background about me, and I'll point to a couple of things up here. I played college basketball, okay, Division I college basketball. I was actually recruited by a number of different colleges and universities, um, and my brother and I were told by our parents that if you want to get out of this godforsaken town, you have to do it yourself. And we practiced and practiced and practiced, and I'm going to come full circle to this in a minute. And we were pretty darn good. And we we're fortunate to get a Division I scholarship to play college basketball, but we wanted to play together. So the pack, it was a package deal. You, you either take one twin, you can't take one, you can't take the other, you got to take us both. So we ended up getting recruited by a guy named Bob Donwald at Illinois State University. 
And we ended up signing our letter of intent and went there for our first year, and he ended up getting fired. So you're, you're, a guy, you're a young man from Michigan in Illinois, in normal Bloomington, in the center of, of, uh, of Illinois, and your coach loses their job, and you're like, what are we going to do? We don't know anybody else but our coach and the, and the players on the team. Well, he ended up ironically getting hired at the at Western Michigan University, which is another Division I school, but in the, the Mid-American Conference. And I remember this to this day. I was coming back from campus from a class. And I don't know if you know anything about Illinois, but it's, it's central Illinois is a plain state, just like it would be in Kansas. So I'm walking back from class. And this is probably around 7 o'clock at night in April. Wind starts picking up. What is going on? Dust start blowing all over the place. Within minutes, I was in a dust storm. Could, I couldn't figure out where I was at. I, found, I was afraid that I was going to end up in the street, get hit by a car or whatever. So I ended up feeling against a wall and ended up walking into a building until it blew by. So a half hour goes by, and then I see that it's kind of let up a little bit, and I, I get out of the building, and I walk back to this place called Watterson Towers, which was like this 44-story building that they housed everybody on campus, basically, if you were an underclassman. So I get to Smith floor, and I get there, and my brother's in the room with the coach's son, and they're sitting there, and I can say this because I'm technically on duty, but I'm not on duty. But they were sitting in the room having a beer. I don't know how many beers they had, but there were quite a few that were in the room. And, and I walk into the room and everything. I say, you know, I almost lost my life walking in, in, into, you know, a, a dust storm and everything. They said, yeah, yeah, we noticed that. We, get, we came right into the building and we, we came up here and waited for it to, to, to end and everything. And that was the moment they, my brother told me, oh, yeah, by the way, um, I just transferred to Western Michigan University. And the coach's son's like, yeah, he did. And what are you going to do? So it's those, those situations that happen. I've already made friends with the whole team and a bunch of other individuals and everything. And now suddenly, you know, my brother decides he's going to transfer. Now, it was, like I said, a package deal, right? And that's what I, t I, I waited a moment thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, this is, this is not good news. Why didn't you talk to me about this first, right? But I said it's a package deal. Right? Because you don't turn your back on family. That's one thing I learned, right? And your friends. And the coach's son was a friend of ours. So I was like, well, if, if your dad has another uh, scholarship, I'll transfer too. So the next day I transferred, and then the following year we were over here. Now, the point that I'm making is this. When you're an athlete, it's a different dynamic, right? Because you practice with these individuals, you travel with these individuals, and you play games with these individuals. You win games, you lose games. You go from high experiences winning championships and lows of losing games, right? Losing championships, right? You build friendships. But at, that, at the time I was on the team, I was not thinking about anything but being a professional basketball player. I mean, that's, that, that's how much time my brother and I, all of us, we practiced, and that's all we did. That's all I did, right? But it wasn't until I actually worked a basketball camp with kids that I realized I wanted to be a teacher. And that, that right there was an epiphany moment for me because I, I remember my mom and dad telling me, don't go into education. Find something else for an occupation, right? But being a twin at a camp, with your twin brother, what do you think? All the kids are coming to who? They're coming to the twins, right? So we would have, everybody's like, what's going on? Everybody's going right to the twin stations over here. You know, you had the twins over here, and all the kids would be over. They thought it was funny and it was great, you know, because he was 32 and I was 34. This was, this was me, and that is him. But all these guys are our buddies. And being an athlete, your friendships extend beyond your culture, right? Where you're born and raised and where you're, you come from. So it was through the athletic experience that I built friendships and relationships with individuals who, are not who weren't the same as me. They were all different. 
you know, this, this gentleman right here is still a good friend of mine, Vinton Bennett. He was an Olympic high jumper for, uh, he was from Toronto, Canada, was recruited to play for the team. He was the Canadian high jumper in the 1990, it was one of the 90 Olympics. You know, those are individuals you meet. We're still friends to this day. Um, but the point I'm trying to say is, this is a little bit about me growing up as a kid. But again, back to the point, why I'm here. When you make a connection, you share the same values and the vision as the district. Why not? Right? So that's why I'm here. The other part of it is, too, the board just doesn't just hire somebody that they like. Okay, that's maybe a little bit of that. They hire somebody because they want that person in that position. Right? So all the information, my experiences, and the work that I've done, I worked uh, 11 years in Detroit public schools working with underprivileged kids, um, kids who couldn't read, kids who came from poor families, kids that came from broken homes. Uh, I did that for 11 years. Loved it. The one thing I will tell you, though, working in, in, in the city school district in the city of Detroit, there was a lot of stuff that was going on at the time. We were going through all these different superintendents. Nobody knew their name, which is another thing I wanted to let you know. I want everybody in Roosevelt to know me. But we never knew their name. We were all getting laid off at the end of the year and getting called back to work on Labor Day weekend. So you get tired of that, right? Going through a number of different strikes, labor issues and the like. Um, you decide, you know what? Maybe this isn't for me anymore. So I ended up applying for some positions, some principalships, and ended up in a suburban district just outside of Detroit, Roseville Community Schools, where my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter graduated from. Worked there for 10 years, and then applied for a position as superintendent, because again, like I said, they recruit you. I got a phone call, said, you know what, would you be interested in this position? I took the position after the board decided to choose me and I worked in that district, and the goal for them was to take the district from good to great. That, that's the goal, that was the goal that I was assigned to do. And I took it from that level to this level. Through all the experiences I learned in the city, to the suburbs, to the country area to the thumb. So all those experiences you take with you, right? And when you take those experiences with you, you use that with the work that you do. Now, right now I'm building a team, right? I've got Team Roosevelt. I always say this and I will always say this next year when you get your shirt, you're gonna get a shirt and it's gonna say on the front of it what I have up here at Roosevelt versus everybody. But I always say in the closing of my communications I sent out to my families, I always tell them this, Together we are one Roosevelt, but it's the number one, the number one. So having said that or shared a little bit of that and doing my research on the history of the district, one thing I will tell you, this is what I, I, I think of Roosevelt has produced some amazing individuals or graduates. Like I didn't know Dr. J graduated from Roosevelt High School. You know, be, he would, I remember him, my brother and I had a poster in our bedroom of him. With, you know, he was our idol, right? And here I am working in the district that he graduated from, right? The other thing I'll tell you, um, Chuck D, right? Public enemy, right? They're, they're talking about naming the highway after one, what is, what's the song? I don't remember. What, one of the songs they're going to name the highway. Um, Howard Stern. I didn't know that, you know, none of this stuff, you know, and it, the list goes on and on and on and on. So Roosevelt produces individuals that go on to do greater things. But I will tell you this, I can't speak for a charter, okay? They don't have that history, 60 years, right? Now, there's a couple of things I want to also talk to you about. Um, this year, we're very, very proud of bringing some new things to the district. 
one of the things that we've brought forth is we've changed our student information system from power school to infant and campus. You know, we, we noticed that we were having some problems with scheduling, um, grades, um, progress reports, the parent portal with PowerSchool, and it, it wasn't really, the interface wasn't really user friendly. So I'm told, because I know with experience that PowerSchool, it takes, everything takes multiple steps to get to where you want to go, right? So we transitioned over to Infinite Campus this year. Now it is a process, because I, I know I have some staff in the room right now saying, yeah, yeah, but it's going to take a while. That's all I'm going to tell all of you. Um, but we're getting good at it, and, and the families are getting used to it. We also have what I call an app to G app. Now, if you go to um, Apple Store or Google Play, you can download the app. All you have to do is type in Roosevelt. And the app will be there. Download it, and you'll get all the information that we push out from that app on your phone. Like tonight, homecoming on the 26th, which maybe there'll be a game or not because the team that we're playing is a charter and the charter team may not be able to feel the team because they're having problems with players on the team. But anyway, enough about that. But the point is you want to download the app to G app because if you want to stay updated, know more about what's going on in the district, this is the way to do it. Okay. We also have something I want to, I'm very, very proud of the board of education in their vision because of our student demographics, we have brought forth an, a special elective into the district. And the elective is a history class. Um, it's Black and Latino History 365. They're two separate classes. You can take the Black History 365 or the Latino History 65 class. Now, this class that you can get an elective credit for, which will lead you to a potential advanced placement class for college credit the following year. The key to this, though, and th this was the, the board's vision, was because the traditional history that's being taught in our schools doesn't reflect a well-rounded history. It is, it is essentially a history of who won, right? And the Board of Education and district leadership team, as well as our staff, strongly believe that this particular course not only has value, but it will allow our students to see themselves in the history of not only the country, but in the entire world. And here's the other thing, and I'm, I'm almost 100% certain on this. We're the only district on Long Island offering this, these courses, okay? That's something to be proud of too, but at the district level and here in Roosevelt. So another item that I wanted to bring to your attention, you'll see that around the campuses right now, you'll see a lot of solar panels being put up. They also have solar canopies, which are these areas where you think it's like a parking structure, but on top of the actual canopy are actually solar panels that are gonna be brought into the grid to reduce the cost of the district because right now we're spending all of our money sending it to the utility companies. We're trying to save the money so that we can put more of that money back into our fund balance to pay for special programs like Black History and Latino Histories 365 and the like. Um, so that money we're saving, we can use for our other programs and services that we're offering in the district. So this is new. So we have new HVAC units um, at the middle school. We've been having some challenges with that climate control system, but hopefully we've got that figured out um, and the like. Another thing I wanted to point out to you is this. The state of New York has created a portrait of a graduate. Roosevelt's going to do their own portrait of a graduate. What does a Roosevelt graduate look like once they complete the 12th grade here in the district? This is a project that we're working on. It will involve staff, it will involve administration, it will involve students and community members and parents. This right here is a, a key piece because we want to know when a kid leaves, what does that student look like? What are the soft skills that they're going to leave with, right? What are the hard skills that they're going to leave with? That's something that we're going to produce and we're going to share with the community and we're going to need your input once we have this out here. Um, when we collect it, we'll share it when we're done with it. 
and it's going to be a project that we're going to be very, very proud of. This will be done this year. We're also doing a refresh for our strategic plan. There was a five-year strategic plan that was in place that was done five years ago uh, with the former superintendent of the Board of Education. We are in the fifth year. We're in the process right now of taking what it is that we've done over five years, reflecting on it, and having discussions about where do we want to go from here. This piece will be a part of it, the portrait of a graduate. Okay. The other thing, too, um, and Dr. Regina Williams, who is a trustee on the Board of Education, who's here tonight, let's have her stand for a moment, and let's give her a round of applause for taking time out of her day to be here. Dr. Williams and the Board of Ec Education and I have gone to a number of different um, conferences. And when we go to conferences, we learn a lot. We learn not only from the individuals that are doing the presentations, but we also learn from the individuals from other districts that are there as well. And at this one particular conference that we had went to, and I think it was in Albany, New York, there was a gentleman called Bill Daggett, and if you want to write that name down, put that name down in your book or on a note. Research him. He is a, a expert in his field with regards to what is coming in education in the future. And in that discussion that he shared with the Board of Education, in order for us to be prepared for what is going to be taking place in the future, we have to be mindful of what it is that technology is going to bring forth. Right now, the cell phones, right? There's a big battle at the state level about should we ban cell phones? Should we keep cell phones in the hands of our students uh, and the like? Well, I will tell you this, it's, it's a losing battle because what happens is kids have the watch. You're going to ban the watch? Everything's coming in on the watch. See, Dr. White, look, I got a new one. I got an Apple Watch. It just comes right in on that. So you're going to ban cell phone. doesn't matter. You're still going to have access to that because the watches do the same thing. You know, text messaging, emails, phone, even have phone calls on, on the watch. You think it was James Bond, right, where you'd say, I don't have a problem. I'll just pull up my watch, press a button, and then all of a sudden something happens. But that's, that's our reality. But the point that I'm trying to make is, we have got to be prepared as not only educators, but also as parents and citizens in the community for all of the advanced things that are taking place. And I'm going to tell you this, too, because this was shared with us as well. If you're not aware, if you know anything about quantum physics, physics is a very complicated science, right? And what they do is they try to explain things that are unexplainable, right? And if you want to think about Einstein, he probably is the greatest quantum physicist in history, right? But right now, according to Bill Daggett, and this is, a, if you write this down too, write down 60 minutes quantum computer. Quantum computer. There is a race, just like it was with the arms race, you know, trying to get the A-bomb, before everybody else during World War II, right? There is a arms race happening right now, trying to get to the moon during that period of time when Kennedy was here and, and, and NASA doing what they did to be the first to be to the moon. There is an arms race of trying to be the first to, be in, to get to Mars, right? But there's an arms race to be the first country or business, Microsoft, Tesla, Google, IBM, to get the first quantum computer. Now, let me tell you this. If you think today's technology is fast, a quantum computer will give you answers in an instant. Now, I will tell you this. Last thing on this piece alone. Quantum computing they say the country or the business that gets it first will rule the economy. Which controls everything. The other thing, we have competition in the world, right? And I'll give you an example. China. You've heard about the TikTok app that everybody's upset and worried about at the government level? Let me tell you why, because everybody's saying, What's, it's just, an, it's just a, a, an app. 
that our kids go on and, and, and the like. Well, what's happening is that app is owned by the Chinese government, and all of those TikToks are being collected. When they get the quantum computer, all that information gets uploaded into the system and dumped. They know everything. They will know everything about what it is that the American society location of, what, of New York, Long Island, what you do, what you buy, and what you like, and what you and, and how many times you're on Facebook. All that information gets compiled. You remember the balloons that were floating around that they were getting shot down um, around the country? They were just collecting information. That information was getting uploaded into a satellite and, and sent down into the country. And they were saving the, they're saving the information so that when they do get the quantum computer, it gets dumped. Okay? That's where we're at. And they're saying within five years, someone's going to have it. Okay? So I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to tell you as your superintendent, in leadership, you have to be knowledgeable of this. And you have to prepare your students and staff. There was an article that came out this morning, and I do a lot of reading. My wife, she can tell you. I never sleep, basically. I don't know. But she will tell you this. Um, you know, I'm always reading, and I'm always writing. The board knows this. And I share information with the board and my staff, my administration, and my team. And I was, I'm going to tell you this. In Massachusetts, there's a lawsuit right now that a family suing a school district for their child using an artificial intelligence platform for the paper that they wrote. They're getting sued. The district's getting sued. This is a district in Massachusetts. You can look that up, too, if you want. But the point is, and I had a parent that just said this, that's smart. Well, it is. Because let's process this for a minute. Everybody needs a personal assistant, right? I got to do a grocery list, right? I got to put together a plan for my, my daughter's wedding. I've got to, you know, make sure that I'm, you know, at the church to do the fundraiser on this particular day. Everybody needs a personal assistant, right? But the key to that personal assistant is you got to know what to tell it to do, right? It's a prompt. Now, don't get me wrong, kids need to know how to read, right? They need to know how to write, they need to do the basics and everything, but they also need to know how to think, right? But in the end, putting this all into perspective, this is not going away. This is the new. Like I got in a conversation with some elementary teachers about cursive writing, right? They went to the board and I said, look, Dr. Wayne, check this out. It was in a third grade classroom. And the teacher's like, can anybody read what it is that I just wrote on the board? No, they couldn't. The other thing, too, and that's not a bad thing, right? But that's something to think about because kids, when you write in cursive, there's a part of the brain that's being accessed to write it, right? That's a conversation we need to have in Roosevelt because that part of the brain needs to be developed. So do we bring cursive writing back? That's a discussion we're going to have with staff, right, administration, because that's part of the brain that's being underdeveloped. Okay? And I can talk to you all day long about brain-based research, but I'm not going to do that because you'll be bored to death and ready to leave and everything. But the point that I'm trying to say is it's these conversations that I have with staff, with administration, with families and parents that I value as a superintendent. But here's the thing. A superintendent that goes to the office, I call it the cave. You open the door, you go into the cave, and you don't come out. You don't interact with people. You don't talk to, to anyone. You go into the room. You do your job for the day, you get in the car, you go home. There's a lot of us that do that. But you can't talk, to, if you don't talk to people, you don't hear these things, right? 
you don't have these discussions, these conversations. Like I have people that come to me all the time. They come up to me all the time because they're comfortable with me. I know when your first impressions are what they are, right? But the point is, when you get to know somebody, you you get to, you're, you're comfortable, you know, speaking to them, having conversations with them. Well, that's he's he's a real person, you know. He doesn't go into the cave, you know, and disappear for the day. You know, it was something that I would tell you this: a dual language or dual immersion program that we're working on here in Roosevelt. Something we should be very very proud of too. Twenty one students graduated last year with a seal of literacy, by literacy. And that's never happened before, 21. But here's the connection to what I'm about ready to share with you. I was at, that's something to be proud of, 21 students with the seal of biliteracy. But that list is gonna get bigger. I was at Washington Rose for the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration last week, okay? I wore my shirt, I was there. Um, it was amazing, it was phenomenal. Kids did a great job, and Ziomar Gonzalez, uh, was there too, our director of, of uh, K through 12 by literacy. She's in the back here and everything. Actually, let's give the team a round of applause too because we have a team here that are actually translating for our individuals who need translation here, here with us tonight that work for, this, for the district that are on my staff. But I was at Washington Rose and it was a second grade group of kids. And I'm sitting next to Dr. Braswell and they're up on the stage performing and then there was a pause. And then three kids said some things in English and also said some things in Spanish. Three, second grade, biliteracy or bilingual. That's amazing, second grader predominantly in the home speaking English, is now bi bilingual. That's the vision of the district. That's where we're headed. Kids will be in the same classroom with students that actually speak Spanish, that speak, speak uh, I think it's French, Croatian French Creole, in the same room, all, all of them in the same room together. And they learn from each other. And all that brain development, all the dendrites that get made with the connections in the head and everything, all of that gets developed. So as the years progress, the value of being multilingual benefits a student that graduates from Roosevelt because now they have more opportunities of employment because they can speak multiple languages, right? And understand what's being said, right? That communication. That's a soft skill that our graduates are going to be having. So the other thing, a couple things I want to touch base with, and I want to take some questions um, from all of you, because I know many of you might want to have some things you want to ask me. Um, PhD science, which is a new science program that we're bringing into the district. The next generation science standards have been out for eight years now. And PhD of science is aligned to those standards and everything. We're bringing it into the district to enhance and strengthen our STEM programs, um, which is science, technology, engineering, and math programs in the district. So these are just basically a summary of everything that I kind of touch base within some of the imagery that goes with it and everything. So at this point in time, I'm going to stop because I've already said a lot. Um, there are two microphones in the room. If you're comfortable, I'm willing because I was going to talk to you a little bit about this, and I know that's not going to take too much time. These are the things that I'm focusing in on as superintendent. There are nine, and I'll read them for you. The Board of Education knows this, and so does my, my team in the district. We're going to have a clear and shared focus. We talked about a refresh of the strategic plan, right, and the portrait of a graduate. That, that, that's that's, that's going to be what we're about, right? High standards and expectations for all students. One thing I will tell you, I was asked by the Board of Education in my interview was this, Dr. Whiteman, what is your philosophy? And I know Dr. Williams knows that. That question was asked. And I told him it's simple. I'm not going to give you all this jargon and all this, this history and all this research. I'll tell you what it is and it's been true to me since the day I started teaching. 
all students can learn. That's my philosophy. It doesn't need to be complicated, but, but it is complicated, right? Because it's, you have to give the right circumstances and conditions for all students to learn. And that's our job. And this is what all we need from our community and our parents. Just get your kids to school. We'll do the rest. Just get them to school. If you're late, that's okay. Just get them to the building. We'll give them a couple meals, breakfast and lunch, and we'll take care of the rest with the educational piece. But the other part is this, we need your help on this end. You have to have one hour of power every night. My brother and I, my, my two sisters, we were not allowed to do anything in our homes until we got what we needed to get done in that hour of power. Your homework, whatever it is that's related to education, you had one hour of power. And it didn't matter. It was the same thing on a weekend. Saturday and Sunday, you didn't get a break. Put your hour of power in. Do your time to become smarter so that you can get ahead of someone else. And that's the, the subculture we need to build here in Roosevelt. Everybody has to have a study table, whether it's in your home or your kids go to the neighbor's house. If, if, if there's Algebra 2 being taught or being uh, discussed at, at the house two blocks down, you need to get on your feet, out the door, down the street, and into that house for that one hour power. Because somebody in that house is going to help you get ahead of other kids. I was going to say that because we're building a strong partnership here also with the Roosevelt Public Library here, and that our power can happen here at the end of the day. As a matter of fact, we're trying to get all of our third grade students, Dr. LeConte, all of our third graders to get an application for a library card, and this should be something standard every year in the district, to have those filled out at home, and for the kids to take a field trip to the library, the stack gets given to them, or it's given to them in advance, and the kids get the card that day, right? But it's the partnership with, with the library that I, we have to have a strong working partnership. Because if we don't, what are we, what are we here for? We're doing, we really want to do the same thing, provide service, right? And we want our community to be educated and to be informed. I mean, that's really the goal. And we can do that together. Effective school leadership, right? Don't just go to the cave and sit there and, and disappear. You got to be out and about, OK? Number four, high levels of collaboration and communication. I'm doing that today with you right now, right? Speak what you need to say, or say what you need to, to speak, and communicate what you want to say. Curriculum instruction assessments need to be aligned to the standards. I just talked to you about PhD science, right? That would be an example. Frequent monitoring, number six, frequent monitoring of learning and teaching. That's just what we do. Seven, focus professional development, not just giving PD for the purposes of PD. It needs to have value, right? A music teacher does not need to have PD and ELA, right? But some, sometimes that happens. I got Mrs. Nesbitt here at the middle school nodding her head saying, yeah, that does. <laughs> Dr. Whiteman. Supportive learning environments, and we do that in our schools. And of course, high levels of community and parent engagement, like we're talking about now. We can't do this alone. Like we talked about at home, it's our power. Get three books, same title, and get three kids in a circle, and you sit there and have them read that to you orally. Doesn't cost you anything. You check them out at the library. And then you take it back once you're done. The key thing to that when you do a little reading circle in your own home is you can ask questions. Well, why do you think that Charlotte didn't help whatever? Didn't help Wilbur the pig, right? Charlotte's web, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to say is you can have that conversation, right? Sheldon Parrish's book, right? We have students that are in our district right now that don't know the history of the district. That should be something that everybody needs to read in our schools. That book, right? Or chapter in that book, which may trigger them to want to buy the book, right? Because they're learning about the families and histories that have gone to school, or families and students in the history of the district, of all the individuals that have worked here. 
graduated and educate here. So, this is why I'm here. I'm here for the kids. Okay? One thing I also told the board is I want what's best for kids. That's, that's also part of my philosophy. It's only about what's best for kids. And sometimes that upsets people because you'll end up, some of the adults will say, well, Dr. Whiteman, you said you want what's best for kids, but why don't you want what's best for us or what's best for all of us? Well, sometimes I can't always do what's best for all of you, but I always will tell you and promise you this, I will always do what's best for kids. And it sometimes upsets individuals or people. But that's okay. We'll, we'll work through it. This is what I'm about. This is what our district is about. This is what I'm proud of, and this is what we'll continue to do. What questions do you have? Anyone can come on up and ask a question if you'd like. Like I had a question earlier, how tall are you? And I get that question all the time from the kids. And I will answer it, and I'm not that tall. I'm only six feet four inches. I just look taller because I'm really skinny. But I get it all the time. I want to thank Joy. My question. You have a question? Go ahead. I got a question. Let me back this up. Go ahead. <laughs> We had a little bit of an exchange earlier today, and I said I was going to probably ask the elephant in the room. And it had a more. To, it had a lot to do. First of all, we want to say thank you. What an amazing conversation that we were in earshot of today. You know. You know when you when you with your when you when you like people, it just happens naturally. You don't even have to say a lot. It's already in that ear way. But there are a lot of people who aren't here, and you have to govern. We still live in a culture, in a country, in a society that you, are as a, an amazing white brother, you're living in a space with these beautiful and amazing brown and black people. And so we don't have real dialogue that really addresses um, not just the, the, the exchanges we have among ourselves and subcultures, you know, whether you're from the islands, whether you're from like Latino countries, whether you're from the south or the north, I mean, all the breakdowns that we know we have, even within our cultures. But to have you standing um, in a space that's going to bring all of this together or try to try to, to surge it, you will see something in a way that you see it, but it'll be a different eye from other people who really have to navigate the world and the country in, in the way that it is. It could be something as small as a high school student who has to, you know, call to get some kind of document for college. And he's going to be met with such resistance. And he's, at some point, he may not know it, but a parent will take the phone. And a parent will engage that conversation and realize their child is being treated this way because of race. Oh, we, we, we think it's race. And we don't want it to be about that. But that is in the room. And we're excited because you feel you are an ally. And so we know that in some ways you will be able to navigate in spaces that other faces and other perspectives would have been ignored. So, you know, thank you for saying yes to this call. It's a big one. It is. I, and I, I will tell everybody this, too. Um, I've seen that. You know, it, let me give an example. It was Valentine's, and, and this is personal. My wife and I were out, I t we went out to eat, or we were going out to eat to this place that we'd been to before. It's called Louis Chop House. And it was Valentine's, and I, I want it was early because we didn't want to get in the middle of all these other individuals out because we just wait hours, right? So we, we ended up going to the, to the restaurant, and I think it was around 4.30, it was early. It wasn't even 5 o'clock. And when we got there, um, there was nobody there. It was like maybe a, a couple couples that were sitting down and eating dinner. And I walked up to the host, and I said, you know, we'd like a table for two. She said, I'll be right back. This is a true story. 
So we're standing, we're standing at, at the counter. I want to say it was like 10 minutes. It seemed like a lot was longer than that. Maybe it was longer than that. Then she comes back. She said, we don't have any tables for you. Process that. There are probably 70, 80 tables in the room. Two people, or maybe, maybe four or five couples that were eating. There was nobody sitting in the uh, other tables. I said, excuse me, what are you talking about? There are, there are plenty of tables that are available, as you can see. Oh, those are reserved. What did the person look like? Blonde hair, blue eyes. Caucasian. <laughs> yeah. So the point that I'm trying to say is, you know, that was an example of the experiences that I've had, right? And I really had a nice conversation with that person, right? And we left, right? Because you don't want to go somewhere where you're not welcome. But back to the point. There are enemies and allies, and that's something I quickly learned in my position as superintendent in Michigan. I worked in a county that was all red, okay? I'm the only Democrat in the county, okay? Long-standing member of the NAACP, right? Port Huron branch. My wife is too, right? We go to the fundraisers and, and freedom fundraisers every year and everything and, and the like, and um, there's enemies and allies everywhere you go. But I was the only Democrat, Democratic superintendent in the county going to meetings and hearing it, right? You know I can't just sit there and let them say it, right? Because, you know, things that are being said that are completely not appropriate, you're going to let, you're going to, Whiteman's going to say something. But the point is, there's enemies and allies everywhere you go. And I want to tell this to the kids, okay? Because this, this is our culture here in the United States. Enemies and allies everywhere you go. The key thing is to figure out who it is that is an ally. Because if you remember, okay, there is in Battle Creek, Michigan, where I student taught, okay, and I, and I student taught in an urban community in Battle Creek, okay, where Kellogg's makes all the cereal that they're all talking about Fruit Loops are bad, right? The, 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 the dye in the Fruit Loops are, are toxic, whatever. But the point I'm trying to say is, Sojourner Truth Highway, it goes right through that city, right? Sister Harriet's work, right? Uh, own a judge getting away from George Washington and Martha Washington. You know, I talked to you about that book. Going into Kenneth Jenkins' uh, vaults and looking at all of his materials and seeing things that I've already read, right, that most people don't. Knowing about Carter G. Woodson, you know, in his work. Right. But the point that I'm tr trying to say is it is an enemy and an ally in, in back when it was then, because someone would be coming into my house. That will be a safe house. On that that road. Because there were safe houses all over the country from down in the deep south all the way up into Canada. But you got to know who they are. And that's why when we have kids here, for example, in the room. You got to know who is an ally. And you navigate that because you're going to land on some landmines. You weren't an ally. You were fake. Too late. Right? That's what I've learned. And, I've, and also, I taught that to the kids, my kids. My own kids and the kids that I've worked with. Right? You have got to know. Everybody in this room knows the most important thing that's going to happen is going to be happening uh, a couple of weeks, three weeks, Tuesday, a week from yesterday, or three weeks from yesterday. That's the most important piece. That will determine what direction this country is going to go. That's something that we all need to be mindful of. And here's the thing. And that's a great question. I've got made it an hour long, though, so I don't know. But the, here's the great thing about it. My wife and I are registered to vote in Michigan. 
this is how important it is to us. If you know anything, Michigan is a battleground state. That state could determine the outcome of what's going to happen uh, uh, in the election. We're going back home to make sure that our vote is going to be counted. So if you don't see me here in town, because there's no school on Election Day. All the schools in, in Roosevelt are closed. And any, any school district should be closed on Election Day because everybody needs to get everybody in the cars and go out and get to the polls. But the point that I'm trying to say is we're going home. We're flying home. We're going to put our vote in. And on Wednesday, we're going to wake up in the morning and we're going to have a great celebration. Okay? Or... We're going to have to figure out what we're going to do. We might have to move. And we live across the bridge from Canada. But, you know, I'm here in New York, right? So, but here's the other thing. I wanted to tell you this. I don't know if you knew this, too. And um, Dr. Williams, she's not here for right now. But I wanted to tell you this. Um, my secretary, Mrs. Battle, is in the room. And I, I want to tell you what's interesting. I reached out to the party to try and get uh, Harrison Walls here in Roosevelt. Offered the stadium and the field um, on the campus. Um, haven't heard back, um, but I would love them to come visit the Roosevelt. Roosevelt has, a, has the history, right, the community, right, and the leadership to have them hosted here. But I will tell you this. I didn't think about it until after I submitted it. I don't know what we would do because in the end, ultimately, all the roads would be shut down. How would you get to school? Right? They shut down everything. Downtown, they, sh they were shutting everything down. You couldn't even get, get, you know, get into the city or out of the city. You know, they would literally have to shut down the whole, t whole community. You know, we would have to, have, nobody would be able to go to work for the day. Everybody would just come, come to, the, to, to the high school. But I did. I submitted that. I haven't heard back. And it, it, if you don't know this already, I'll tell you this. I'm very well connected uh, to the Michigan party. The Democrats. I reached out to them. I said, can you get them over here? I, I, has she been on Long Island yet? A couple times? We need. Okay. We were at a meeting last night. You know, the town of Hempstead had its board. It had its budget meeting and review. And so there were many people who were up in arms over the fact that the Trump rally took place at Nassau Coliseum. And the exchange that they were having was finding out that some of the taxpayers' money funded that function. And so that was a huge question that kept getting asked, never got answered, but it made me realize that, you know, as much as we think we're in these isolated spaces, like even as you're speaking now and having a conversation about um, your role of, of, of course, your excitement of getting Harrison Waltz here, Long Island, because you are new to this space, I grew up in, that probably didn't realize until I went to college and went into a college space with all these other students, having all these different types of friendships and relationships. I didn't realize how racist Long Island was until I went to college. And then I returned and was like, what is this? So that said, you know, we started that conversation. We talked about, you know, um, the heavy laden, uh, you know, uh, uh, direction in the, in the, in not, not in the Harris and Waltz backyard, but that's a Long Island space that we don't talk about. But that's correct. Yeah. Here's, a, here's one thing also I'll say, um, and this is, this is something that was starkly uh, realized by my wife and I when we were looking for somewhere to stay. You know, we're not used to the cost of how much houses are here in Nassau County. We were, it was sticker shock. You know, when, when they said that, you know, no, that house is uh, half a million dollars, okay, and it's a two-bedroom flat, you know, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute here. We're, we're trying to figure this out. We know we're in New York, but, you know, in Michigan, a 500 or a half a million dollar house is a palace. You know, we could have bought the house that we live in now, we could have bought maybe three in Michigan, Right? The point that, to your point, one of the things that we realized um, coming here, driving around trying to find somewhere to stay, is 
And this is an outsider talking now. Okay. Long Island is one of the most segregated places I've ever been. Now, let me walk this back, though, because my wife knows what I'm going to say next. I don't even have to say it. She knows what I'm going to say. But here's the thing. Coming from where my wife is from and I, and I worked and where I lived as well in Michigan, have you ever heard of the word or heard of the street 8 Mile? Okay, if you know Eminem, he's a rapper and all that, and really, you know, he's done really well and all that from Michigan. And 8 Mile was his big hit record, right? Well, 8 Mile was the red line, okay? And Detroit was redlined. 8 Mile, the property values north of it was astronomical. No one could afford it, Right? Property values below it were more reasonable. Hence, concentrations of individuals such as myself, my wife, and, and, and the like, the affordability becomes the issue, right? So that area, there was a, an area which was where I-75 was built, which is the interstate I-75 that goes all the way down from Michigan down through Florida, built right in the middle of Detroit, in this one section that individuals refused to give up their property or land, they called it Black Bottom. So what they did is said, okay, you don't want to give up, we're going to build a highway right through your neighborhood. And they did it. And that's the history of Detroit. I-75 all the way down to, to uh, Miami, I think it goes that way, I don't know. That Interstate I-75 goes through. They drilled it right in the middle of the, t of the community. True story. Redlined. But when you drive through, because we, we've, we've driven through the area, Hempstead, Uniondale, Roosevelt, um, Freeport, and um, Westbury. Is that right? That's, that's where everything has been redlined. So when you go further east, totally different. Garden City. What? Right? Garden City. Remember that, hun? Like, what, what, what is this? Right? And then you get into West Hempstead, and then there's Garden City. And then there's Cathedral Village, right? Don't forget the Cathedral Village, right? We were like, this is, this is just absolutely ridiculous. But to your point, we noticed that when we first got here. We were just driving around, you know, because you have to get acclimated. Like I had Dr. Moore, who is also here with us in the room. Let's give her a round of applause tonight as well. <laughs> Board member of, of uh, Roosevelt. Uh, actually, her sister is here as well, former board member of Roosevelt School District as well. So also with Hofstra University. So the point that I'm saying is she's, she's taught me all that. She told me all that, reading her book too. I mean, she, uh, she is an encyclopedia of history. And she's an activist, right? We all know that. And here's the thing, that's a jewel. And she's going to be honored coming up in January. You want to talk about that just for a minute? What, what, it's for the, what's the, 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 I have to say this because this is an incredible accomplishment. Here it is right here. She's going to be honored. Yeah. Well, I will tell you this. Any, anyway, um, the superintendent, he, he, God sent, he's a blessing. People were saying, well, who this white man you have in our district? I said, his wife is as black as you and me. <laughs> I said, number one, when I traveled the world, when I came back here 50 years ago, when I was in the Peace Corps, I said, kids, third and fourth graders, they spoke two and three languages. 
I said, we need to have Spanish and French, Spanish, English, French. And, and somebody said, well, wh why do you have Chinese? I said, look on the back of your shirt. We have to understand we're in an international world. As a phys ed teacher, I told them there were seven continents. You are competing with the world. And we have to train and talk to our people about homeschool and community. It's an international world. And uh, this is a picture that I have here. This is a one whom I saw when she was in Canada. This is uh, uh, Jackson from Roosevelt. This is, uh, we, we say this is Harris. This is Sabrina McKnight. I had her in the seventh and eighth grade. These people, I took these pictures. They were, these people was in Roosevelt. She, Harris was here when we didn't even know who Harris was. This here is Bonnie Hazelton, who was the superintendent. She's here with a picture with Harris. That's my goddaughter. This is the international world. We are competing with the world. And you know what? People know, know this one square mile. And, and Sheldon, when Sheldon came back to school and was complaining, I said, you need to write and tell your story. He ended up before he passed, he wrote three books. But I said, you can't complain. You done went to some of the top schools in the country. You know the condition. You tell your story. And that's what I tell everybody. Write your book and tell your story, your family legacy. Because if we don't do it, you see, they don't want us to have, they don't want to have a library like this, an African-American museum that we have here. Our history, our ancestors built this country. Our ancestors, some jumped the boat, some died, but they said, mm-hmm, and they, made it possible for us to be here today. And that's what keeps me going. What are you doing? Yeah, she told me, to my mother said, try your best, went to the third grade. My sister said, memorize the book. And you know what my father said? He from North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, and my mother was from South Carolina. And he said, that black stuff ain't gonna get you number of trouble. You have to understand, like um, John Lewis, he said, big trouble. I met John Lewis at Morgan. I met John Lewis in Freeport. John Lewis said we was the first group that said no bail, we staying in jail because we wasn't paying $600. That was our tuition at Morgan. And they wanted $90,000 from those 218 students who went to prison. We said no bail, we staying in prison. Then they, they, they let us out after a week and that's how I met Dr. King, Mrs. King and them. The world came to Morgan and now that same Morgan, that shopping center that we demonstrated in, in 63, Morgan owns that shopping center. I got pictures in here that, that could show that. Let's give, uh, let's give board president, Dr. Moore, a round of applause. I also want to mention too, that we could talk for, for the rest of the night, to be honest with you, but the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Long Island Chapter is gonna be honoring Dr. Moore and that will be coming up in January on the 11th, which will be in Mineola, New York on Saturday. Um, and I guess that's off the Jer Jericho Turnpike. <laughs> so having said all that and having an opportunity to spend some time with you and everything, I wanna do one thing before we're... Yes, sir. Could you, you want the microphone? Go ahead. My name is uh, Don Cromel. I'm the one that sent you those books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to Roosevelt. So everyone in the room knows my pet peeve has always been uh, our graduation rate. And uh, I think right now we're at 83, 84%. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation on changing the pathways for graduation, which is very, very important. Since 1990, when the Regents came into effect, it destroyed the Roosevelt School District, especially young black males. Where, and I, I'll just give you a, a quick story. A young man who um, did all the, all the classwork for living environment, and whenever it came for him to pass the regional exam, he just came up short. So he's working at Walmart now. He's a great worker at Walmart, and they wanted to give him a promotion couldn't get it because he didn't pass living environment on the regent's exam. And that's just so discriminative towards one exam, you just, we just ruined this young man's life forever because of living environment. So now that we're at back at the table talking about other pathways for graduation, 
I just want to make sure, Doc, that you continue the conversation with the Board of Regents so that there are other stories like that where young people, I, I worked for the district for 35 years as the attendance officer and as the master scheduler. So I know getting kids to come back at 19 and 20 years old just to pass maybe Algebra 1 where they came up a little short, it's just, it's just not right to ruin somebody's life in that way. Very good. Come on up. Yeah, sure. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. Let's give him a round of applause and everything, too. Hi, good evening. Um, I've lived in the Roosevelt area since 98. Um, I do have a 10-year-old kid who is now being a ben beneficiary of the Roosevelt school system. Um, it was not an easy ch um, transition to get her into the school district of Roosevelt, but one of my concerns are is my kid has a disability. Yep. Um, I find that I am facing a little bit of frustration with the school district as in reference to how are you, what resources are you, um, have readily available to meet my kid at the point of her need. So what can be done for parents like myself that lives and support the Roosevelt School district. This so is what we I help our children. Thank you for, for sharing that. Here's the thing I will tell you. I'm all about what's best for kids. I've already shared that. I want what's best for kids, regardless of where they're at academically, if they can pass a test, or if they need additional help and support. But I can't do it unless you tell me you have some concerns. Now that beautiful lady over here in the back of the room, my wife, has my business cards. Grab one of my cards, send me an email with your contact information, and I will set up a meeting with you personally to discuss what it is that you just shared with me so I can address those with my team. Appreciate it. I appreciate you sharing it, though. I have one other um, yeah. You mentioned the red line. Um, so, my first experience with trying to introduce my child to the school district was, oh, we have to do an evaluation, mm -hmm. and then that will determine if she's able to go to the school in her district. Otherwise, we'll send her out somewhere. I've experienced that when we were in the Brooklyn area, and I come to Long Island, I didn't expe expect to experience that because I've been living here for, like I said, over 20 plus years now, and I've been paying the high taxes that we complain about occasionally. But still, I'm told that it's possible she might be on a bus going to BOCES somewhere where she doesn't fit in that. It's not what's going to assist, help her academically. I was literally told by the district that I've been living in for how many years that, um, well, you know, they can learn after a certain age. They who? Okay. Well, that's why I need you to set up an appointment to meet with me, and we can have a further discussion about what your concerns are, because what it is that's been being said is not what we're about. Okay? So let me know what, whatever your time works best with you. My secretary's in the room. Diane, raise your hand. You'll be talking to her, and then we'll set up a time to talk, and I'll I'll address that with my team. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate time. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Have a question? Yes. Mi pregunta es casi igual a lo que ella decía. My question is similar to the to the lady. Porque para los yo siento de que se tardan mucho para dar evaluaciones cuando los niños son como con un récord especial. She feels that um, when you have a special need um, child, it takes a long time for an evaluation. Y aunque no sea que esté en un nivel tan alto que se pueda ver físicamente, el, la especialidad que ese niño necesita, yo siento de que no están dando aquí en Roosevelt lo que esos niños, la oportunidad para esos niños como desarrollarse más. 
She said that even though if you don't see the level of um, need on the student, like um, evidently that um, it does take a long time and we're not offering what's necessary for them and it takes really long. Yo pienso de que cuando los niños los mandan a otra escuela, a otro distrito, porque tienen una necesidad más especial, en esa escuela trabajan más con esos niños, sin importar la especialidad. She feels that uh, when you have a special needs student and they're sent to another district to help them, she said they do get the services they need there and they do um, value those students more than they do at any other district that do doesn't have special need kids. Yo tengo uno en la middle school que, que él, I have one in middle school and I feel like the help that he need, he's not getting it. I always request why they don't do the need, whatever he need. Since he was in first grade or kindergarten, I request he need to read eighth grade and he's not reading well, eighth grade. And if you see how he put his name, you look at that like he's still in kindergarten. And it's one thing that I talk a little bit English and I can understand a little bit of your conversation, but not that much. I don't read at all. So how can I help him if he, I don't know how to do it? So this is like a blind walking, trying to show someone how to walk. So that's what I feel with my son. That's what I came here because I want to the people in the school understand that it's not only me, there's only parents that we need more help for our kid because that's why we, they are in school. And we're Spanish, I born here, but they bring me to El Salvador and I don't learn the much English that I should get when I was little. I, I want the best for my son. I want my son to be better than I and then other people because that's the reason why we send them to school. And sometimes when we request this, they look at us like, we are not asking more that we can get. You know, he's in eighth grade. And if you see the letter, you cannot believe. I have the other one that he's in second grade. And he write his name better than, than the eighth grade. So I, and always I have to they always something to be in top and top and top, and I don't feel like they are listening to us. And I know it's not only me, but I'm the only one that came here to talk because our kids need more help. They need yeah. support to help them with homework. I don't have um, time because I have to bring this one, thank you, to, um, como se dice, clase de ortopedia? She has to bring it um, to um, orthopedic um, therapy. therapy. So I don't have enough time to be here, to be there. I cannot put him early in the school when they give the little service because he's in a bus. I cannot bring him there because I have to wait for the bus for the other little boy. Mm -hmm. So if you can help with that, we're going to appreciate it. Well, muchas gracias. I will say this. No hay problema. Okay? You're, I'm here. Right? And I'm listening to you. Right? The key thing is my team is here too. And they're listening. Okay? You have my card. Contact me. Just like I had indicated earlier. We'll set up a time to talk in more detail to, address, to, to listen, for me to listen to your concerns to, and to address those concerns, okay? But I want what's best for all of our kids. And I know my team does too. And if there's some things that we can do differently or do better, that's what we'll do. Thank you. Okay? Contact Diane, you have my card, okay? Perfectamente bien, muchas gracias. Hi. Ah. I think, I think, 
I think that's just about our time. I know it's already 8.30 and the Mets are playing. I don't know what the score is, but we want to make sure the Mets get in. We want a Subway Series for the... Um, if, if anybody would like to speak to me, contact me. Um, my wife has my card back here. Um, you'll be talking to my, uh, my uh, secretary. Um, anything you share with her, Diane, it's a, she's a confidential secretary. She doesn't disclose that, but just to me in my office. So having said that, one thing I want to just say. She does? Well, do we have a microphone over there for her? I want to give wow. I want to give you some words of encouragement, everybody here, because each one of us can help maybe 10 other people, maybe 20 other people, 30 or 40. But I was 18 years old before I knew my mother could not read. She's out of, she came out of South Carolina. We didn't go to school. She had a stepmother who was educated. But her biological mother, of course, died when she was young. And, and I didn't even know till I was 18 years old that my mother could not read. I'm talking about read. This. Every little word. She could not read. At 18, I was graduating from Roosevelt High School. Freeport High School. And I decided to do something about it. So I started teaching her at home. We would read the Bible together. We went to church together. But I still didn't know she couldn't read. I'm talking about little words. And as a result, I started teaching her to read. And I was 18. That means she was twice my age. Uh, that's when she learned to read. So don't give up. Keep going. Do what you have to do. And your children that can read and write and do other things, be thankful that they have the brain to re receive it, even if you didn't. Thank you. So I do want to say this um, as we wrap the night up together. This is just my time and visit with all of you. I want to thank all of you for coming out and spending some time with me. Um, I hope it's been worth your time and worth your while. But I also want to thank my team. I got my staff here, Ms. Gonzalez and her team. Let's give them a round of applause for doing the <laughs> translation and interpretation. I appreciate them coming out and all my staff that are here with us as well. But I also want to do this. Joy, come on up here. Now, your team rolls about too now. Now, Superintendent Conference Day, I gave my team a special shirt. I'm going to give you the shirt too. All right? Now, two things. She got the blue and the gold right there. Let's give her a round of applause. She's on Team Roosevelt. Now, on here, I want you to see at the bottom here, we are Roosevelt Empowered, Proficient, and Globally Ready. That gold, I told my staff, on that shirt, represents the sun, the sun rising, right? But don't forget, there's blue in that shirt, and we're making sure that our team is globally ready. Student to student, teacher to teacher, parent to parent, community, school or library, you got it. Thank you so much for your time and everything. I appreciate all of you. I want you to enjoy your rest of your evening, and then go Mets. Right? Go Mets. And that's all I have. So before you all leave, I just want to say again, thank you for choosing to come here for this very intimate night and conversation. I want to thank our board of trustees. We do have one of our trustees here, Tanya Poise. If you could just wave your hand. She's been so supportive. Um, we have a new uh, youth services librarian who is heading that whole department, Rabia Hope. Can you please stand? She's already had several visits from the uh, school district. We have a host of other people here. Jace, thank you again. Um, those who aren't, well, you can see them, but we've had a host of young people who have really supported the library and kept us, um, kept us intact. So we are grateful for everyone who comes this way and spends this kind of time with us. 
uh, Dr. Whiteman and I have lots of conversations that we'll continue to have. We've talked about the 365, and, and we have talked about at the library that we wanted Kenneth Jenkins' collection to be an AP course. And okay. And then we meet, because this is a conversation I've been having the last couple of years as curator, and then we meet, and here it is. But that's, that's the universe, and that's the, you know, the, 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 the gift of God. So get home safe. We'll see you guys soon. Come back. We have a couple of things we'd like for you to be aware of that's coming up. We have the big uh, trunk or treat that happens on October 31st here. Um, we, need, we need your trunks. <laughs> I mean, not those trunks. I mean, your car trunks to decorate so that we can have other vehicles here for the kids that day. Uh, Deborah Moulet, a legislative Deborah Moulet is here tomorrow for a conversation about what's been happening in Roosevelt. That's happening at 6.30 as well. So please keep coming back. Check out our website. Uh, we have some QR codes that are happening on some of the flyers. Just l type in Roosevelt Public Library. We have an amazing array of resources. Um, Tudor.com, we've, we heard, we've, we've heard you guys, you know, and these are things we've already been talking about, especially the cursive writing. We just had that conversation, at least we wanted to bring back things we know were no longer in the classroom. Because we've had kids have to sign their name for employment here, and they could not sign their name. And they were, t they were 17 and 18 and 20 years old, and they could not write in cursive writing. So it, it, it is something that we definitely want to bring back. Thank you, have a great night. I'm sorry that I took up more time than I had expected to. Dr. Whiteman is here if you wanna come over and take a picture with him, so I can post it, right? But <laughs> please have a nice night, um, get home safe. <laughs>